Anyways, I'm Scotty Neal. For some that might know me, I probably owe you money, but I'm sorry about that. Anyways, I have a very interesting story. Uh, who knows the story of the horse soldiers? The first Green Berets behind the lines after 2001 that linked up with the Mujahideen. Nobody? You saw the movie. Whoa, here we go. No, I'm not Chris Hensworth. I was the horse in the movie, right? Because all officers like to ride the NCOs. Anyways, I grew up here in Central Florida. I joined the Army when I was 18. Uh, I did regular infantry. My first combat was into Panama, and uh, it was very quick. America likes to beat up on, you know, little countries, and it was over in a few weeks. Came home, but during that mission, I saw some Green Berets running around with baseball hats, kind of doing what they wanted while we were standing in formations and counting our bullets and, you know, doing things that regular Army people do, and I said, I need to do that. So I went through Special Forces Selection in 92 and 1993. I went to 5th Special Forces Group. During that time, 5th Special Forces Group, we deployed throughout the Middle East. I went into Africa. I went into Pakistan. I went into Saudi Arabia, Yemen, all of these Middle Eastern countries. It was a great and glorious time to be a young Green Beret. And then on 9-11, things changed. As a matter of fact, my team was getting ready to go on 1 October to be part of the Commanders in Extremist Forces which is a small group that's forward-based, uh, that is ready for any incident. Uh, you know, you've had previous uh, embassy attacks. You had uh, bombings in Kenya, all these other places. So this forward element would basically be the first to react and go and create reconnaissance and other activity. So I remember on Tuesday, September 11th, our intel sergeant walked in, and he wrote on the board, the World Trade Center has been attacked. And we thought it was just part of a training exercise. An hour later, he comes back in and says the second World Trade Center has been attacked. Okay, complex attack, two World Trade Centers, financial uh, powerhouse of the United States. We just went into this kind of exercise scenario. Actually, we're putting RFI, Request for Information, into the exercise portal. And it wasn't until four hours later that General Mulholland, uh, Colonel Mulholland at the time came in and said, stop. This is for real. And if you did see that movie, 12 Strong, we went to the mess hall. And we saw it like everybody else. And that's what began the journey. By 19 October, two ODAs were sent with their CIA partners behind the lines to link up with any Mujahideen resistance fighters that we could locate. So imagine being given the most impossible mission. One way. Nobody's coming to get you. As a matter of fact, we don't even know if the helicopters at that time could go over the Hindu Kush and insert you. So they restricted our weight that we could carry. And at that time, it was 120 pounds. Now, if you were a soldier, you know your real top limit that you could struggle. And I like all these go racks, but imagine that's 150 pounds. But at 120 pounds at altitude was all we could bring in. So how much water do you carry? How much ammunition? How much food? All of these things you have to calculate down to the ounce. As a matter of fact, we didn't know if there was enough oxygen for the pilots, so us in the back didn't even have oxygen. Most passed out. And at about 2 in the morning, 19, uh, actually 20 October, landed, and we moved to a small compound that we called the Alamo. And from there, that very next morning, we started hearing gunshots, and we thought, this is how it ends. Nobody's coming to get you. Maybe somebody ratted you out. It was their culture at the time, right? There was no guarantees. But luckily, it was the vanguard for then General Dostum, who 20 minutes later come up with another 20 horsemen and got off. Everybody started hugging. And then you realize that he doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak Arabic, which most of us spoke Arabic. Some of us spoke Farsi. So imagine looking at each other for the first hour and you can't communicate. He finally broke open a map, but some of the, the uh, indications on that map are Russian. And Mark, the detachment commander who Chris Emsworth played, spoke Russian. So for the first day, probably two days, it's almost like two three-year-olds talking to each other. And that's how it began. The war on terror started with 40 horsemen. Mark, who grew up in a working cattle ranch, had an ROTC scholarship at the University of Kansas and a scholarship for rodeo. 
he would ride in the saddle 12 to 14 hours a day going from village to village just telling America's story. By the first week, we had 350 cavalry. By three weeks, we had 3,500 horse cavalry and 1,000 infantry that began to attack the 50,000 person strong Taliban Army of the North supported by 1,000 Al-Qaeda. In less than 100 days, less than 100 Green Berets and our CIA partners had basically completed the entire objective set forth in front of us that the military thought would take three years. We disbanded the Taliban out of the government. We sent bin Laden packing and no longer an influencer in Afghanistan, and we thought the war was over. War's easy, right? Most of us came home by March of 2002, some May, I came home a little bit later, and by October we were notified to get ready for the invasion of Iraq. So guess what? We went forward, the same thing, went behind the lines, worked with the agency, worked on weapons of mass destruction that wasn't really there, right? But it was the same thing, and if you were involved in that initial evasion, war's easy, 90 days. Who remembers President Bush? Mission complete. Wow. Came home, it wasn't but two and a half months later, and we were notified that there's a problem in Africa of foreign fighters streaming across uh, all northern Africa into Egypt and then the land bridge from Djibouti into Yemen. Will you go there and figure it out? So we did. Came home, I think it was about a month later that they said things are really going bad in places like Sadr City and Fallujah and Kerjef. So we went to did that. So this went on for us as a group of friends. All the way until I came to the headquarters of special operations and I got this big fancy title. Matter of fact, I had it all on the front of my desk. I became the senior enlisted advisor to the director of the interagency task force for counterterrorism. Huh? You like that? It fits around your card because I'm an idiot, right? You know, it, but what we soon discovered, it wasn't us fighting our foes. That was a problem. It was our own country coordinating and collaborating. Right? How do we get ourselves together to get ourselves into this fight better? I retired at the end of 2010, and I became one of General Petraeus's counterinsurgency advisors, and I went back. And I was basically a Ronin. I could go anywhere on any helicopter, sit in any meeting. I can go to any tribal negotiations. I can go see the Taliban leadership. And it was basically to ask, why are we still here? And the conversation was very simple. We live here, right? I came home and I told my wife, I'll never do government service again. I had basically burned out. That was it. I saw a lot of friends. We were actually, I started working at the Green Beret Foundation and we were getting more requests for support for Green Berets that had left service and were now injured as a government contractor or they were killed. How do you classify that? What was the problem? And the problem is, is we created such a great group of men that had such strong families and we asked them to do so much that the day after their service, we turned that light off. So I spent some time at the Green Beret Foundation creating a program called the Next Ridge Line. How are we going to get from here to there? And it had really a, a few simple pillars. Number one, like anything in life, find a mentor, somebody that's successful in the area that you think you want to be in. Number two, find yourself, right? Erase your history because if you're stuck in your past, you'll never move forward, right? There's a lot of people that they spend the rest of their life talking about what they did a long time ago. Next is, is get healthy, which I'm not doing very good at because it's be an entrepreneur and embrace it. And that's what I did. I did a fundraiser in New York City. Uh, number one way to raise money is find the richest guy and give him a trophy. So he invites his, sometimes it works on ladies, but guys is really good, right? They'll invite all their buddies and you give them that number one award, right? But on stage, just like this, I said, thank you for your contribution. This program will help support the next Ridge Line. And right now I quit. And if I can't walk off the stage and start my journey, you deserve your money back. And that's what I did in 2015. So the first thing I did was find a friend of mine who was previous generation Green Beret, an agency that totally left that side of government and started his own business with a ranger buddy that went public, $6 billion, 
60,000 employees. It went back private, and he was fired as the number two original founder. By the time public companies come in and everything, they start to... And so he was a little bit lost, too. And what he had found is he had went to Yellowstone. And he spent about three months on his own journey back to nature. And so I asked him to be a mentor. And he said, sure, I'll get to you when I get back from Yellowstone. I said, well, what's going on in Yellowstone? I really literally had not been on a vacation in 15 years. That was the intensity and pace I couldn't get myself out of. He says, well, I like to climb the Tetons. I do some fly fishing. We do a little drinking. It's basically you unplug. And I said, I'm in. I don't have a job. So we did all that. We climbed the Tetons. We, um, you know, set at bars, little, little yokel bars and everything, and just talked about what I could do. And what he was doing is just letting me get it out. Just say, just talk, right? Slow down like a paddy wand. We all see the Kung Fu movies, right? You got the anxious just over here. And he just knew it wasn't time. We did a 10 day horse and mule train through the middle of the thoroughfare. The thoroughfare follows Yellowstone River. It is the farthest off road in America you can go to include Alaska. Less than 100 people are allowed by the park services to apply and go into the thoroughfare. And we did a 10 day horse and mule train. There was nothing to do but worry about bears, right? Other apex predators. We were snacks, delicious meat burritos and tents. But at the end of it, we gave the horses back and we're going out the uh, west gate through Idaho and we saw one little sign that changed our lives. You know what it was? Free tours and tastings this way. It was a craft distillery. It was a mom and pop. We went in there. The wife came to a little bar. She poured us a little vodka. We're like, ah, oh, we're all still dirty from the trail. And she sit there and talked about their family business, right? How they put everything into it. It was the best vodka we ever had. At the time, it was really good, right? So we were so curious about it because of the enthusiasm they had that we Googled the next one and the next one and the next one. And it took us three weeks to get back to Tampa where John's mom said, you drunks need a hobby. So what do you do when you have a lot of fun is you call your friends and tell them about how much fun you had, right? So I called Mark and Bob, and Mark had actually had just gotten back from a rotation. I think he was uh, one of the bodyguards from the president of Iraq, and he, fo he served with a Royal Boat Marine uh, Brit who just started a Scotch distillery. So guess where we went? We went to Scotland. We did the trail. We went up to Thorso, the northernmost city. Um, and we worked there like Kung Fu. We care, we opened the grains, we milled them, we turned the stills on, we learned everything, came back home and said, somebody said, what's the difference between Irish whiskey and scotch? So we went to Ireland and we did the same thing. We, we just went to Teeling brothers. Then we went to Kelbeg and the world's oldest distillery came back and we went into Kentucky. We went into Rick houses. We'll turn the barrels. We'll rotate them. We'll stack them. We'll do anything just to learn. And in 2006, we formed a company and we started flying to a distillery that just opened. And on the weekends, we started making one barrel, five barrel, 10 barrels. And then in 2018, this movie came out called 12 Strong, which nobody participated in. Bunch of Navy SEALs. How many Navy SEALs are in the room? Come on. You know how you know there's a Navy SEAL in the room? They'll tell you. Anyways, I digress. You didn't know there's going to be humor and alcohol, huh? Okay. So imagine, I only have a minute left, so it'll be three more minutes. Imagine starting something you absolutely know nothing about, but you dedicate your lives to. That's what we did as Green Bay's. We had five bottles we filled with some of our whiskey, and we took it to the red carpet premiere, and we got drunk with all those actors. So much so that we came back to a charity event and we met the owner of ABC Liquors. And we told him that we had such a great journey learning how to make it. He says, I'll buy 50 cases. We went and got a U-Haul. We drove him to his facility. He goes, that's not how it works. We didn't know. We brought donuts. Today, uh, seven of us are involved in this company, right? 
We have over 13,000 barrels. We've just broke ground on a $240 million, 5 million gallon facility in Kentucky. So what does this story tell you? Don't be afraid to change directions, right? Because you don't know where you're going to find yourself. It might be positive. Uh, if you serve with a group of friends, you'll serve with them for life, right? And entrepreneurism is real. You can live the American dream you've been defending. With that, I have a red light. And thank you very much. We're going to serve some horse soldier bourbon out here, right? I know you're fit, but I have bourbon.